and welcome to you all and welcome to this session of Leto Lectures as we continue our year-long look at the Office of President of the United States in our lecture series, The Presidency 2020. Now, we are now really getting to the final stages of this year's presidential campaign. Uh, by the time this is aired, both conventions will have been done and over with. Uh, both Joe Biden and Donald Trump um, nominated as the uh, official standard bearer for both the Democratic and Republican parties. The campaign will be in um, some stage of uh, being contested, um, debates scheduled, or just having been held. And we are making our way, of course, to Election Day, November the 3rd. Now, in planning a series of this type, and those of you that have joined us throughout the year, you know that we've bounced around to issues dealing with the Constitution, to the creation of the Office of President of the United States. We've looked at checks and balances and all of the various interactions that take place, not only among and between those different parts of our federal government, but the interaction between federal entities and the individual states themselves. We've looked at some foreign policy challenges. We've looked at the Middle East, we've looked at China, we've talked about NATO and, and foreign alliances, and we've looked at some domestic American issues. And that is one that we are going to take on today, to tackle today, the very thorny issue of immigration and immigration policy in the United States. Now, last year, when, when I was planning this series, 12 years ago, when I was planning a, sim a similar series of this type in 2008, I could have sat down and written a number of issues that I knew then, like I know now, are ones that caused lots of consternation and lots of passionate opposition and discussion within the United States. Earlier this year, we looked at gun policy and all of the various statutes that exist within states of the United States and how the Supreme Court has recently interpreted the Second Amendment. More recently, we've looked again at that great American health care conundrum, how the richest country in the world tries to provide opportunities for more affordable health care to more of our population. Today, we are going to talk about an issue that is every much as passionately debated as those earlier two, every and, and every bit as divisive as those earlier two, and that, of course, is the subject of immigration. Now, four years ago at this time, we were watching a presidential campaign unfold, pitting, of course, former Secretary of State, former presidential spouse, Hillary Clinton, versus businessman, Donald Trump. And on the campaign trail, we would see evidence of Donald Trump running a campaign that four years later brings to the fore several isms, words that we use to describe different aspects of policy, different sets of belief, that have existed in our country and other countries as well um, throughout their um, existence. We saw in Donald Trump, of course, this great appeal to forgotten Americans, those in the Rust Belt, in Pennsylvania, in um, uh, Michigan, in Wisconsin, who'd sort of been left behind that globalization made the world flat. We saw a great example of populism coming forward in his campaign. Now, speaking to lots of Americans, speaking to lots of Americans, particularly who could no longer find these well, good paying manufacturing jobs, we would see the president promise if elected to pull the United States back within our own borders economically. And in fact, we've seen as president, Donald Trump very early in his administration pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
um, which would have been an American-led union of more than 20 countries in the Americas and in Asia that were going to try to collectively use their economic might to match that of China, a country that we've heard a lot about in the last few months. We saw President Trump insist that the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, be renegotiated, which it was. It is now the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement. And we've seen the president use tariffs, the imposition of fees paid for by those who acquire goods imported into the United States from America's various trading partners all around the world. We are watching one of the most vibrant, ardent examples of protectionism at work in trying to protect and resuscitate American manufacturing jobs. We heard candidate Trump, and now for nearly four years, President Trump rail about our foreign policy allies abroad. We've heard that NATO might be an antiquated organization. We've heard that our European partners in NATO, we've heard that South Korea, Japan, and other countries whom we have, for lack of a better word, protected since the end of the Second World War, aren't paying enough, and do these alliances really matter? There were hints of the United States perhaps drifting and gravitating towards isolationism. All of these isms, again, are states of how governments govern. They're not pejorative, they're not intended to be insulting, but they are choices that government make in order to deal with all the various obligations that they have um, to perform. Now, in the campaign four years ago, and at times over the last four years, we've, said, we've also heard uh, derogatory comments made about people coming to live in the United States, particularly those who were seeping through our southern border from Mexico, Central America, and elsewhere. Um, we heard them described at one time as drug dealers and rapists and murderers, and I suppose a few good people there as well. We've heard some of the countries from which legal immigrants come, developing countries, poor countries in the third world, described by the president as, quote, shithole um, countries. And of course, we've heard that the very nature of the rate of immigration, both legal, but particularly illegal, was partially responsible for lots of Americans not being able to hold these good paying jobs. So in the course of using this as an, a very effective means of running a presidential campaign, and then through the actions of some agencies within the executive branch, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Defense Department in some cases, we've seen President Trump begin to build that wall that um, he promised four years ago that we would build. And in stirring up a significant amount of anti-immigrant sentiment, we have seen evidence of nativism, something that we've seen throughout our history at various times evolve as well. A fear, disdain, um, desire to perhaps close some of the entryways that have always made it possible for people from all over the world to come to, to the United States. So having gotten to this last ism, this, this nativism, this fear of those who were not born American, we again have to deal with the, the unbelievable irony that a discussion is of this type is taking place in what is clearly the world's most diverse country. 
the world's most diverse country by virtue of country of birth or country of ancestry, on the basis of language, race, culture, religion, there quite simply is no more a diverse country than the United States. But for at least the last 20 years, certainly throughout the 21st century, the two decades or so that's elapsed so far, we've seen again questions of immigration, immigration policy, and how exactly to treat those undocumented workers coming into the United States ordinarily and overwhelmingly to find work to make better lives for themselves and their families, how exactly should they be treated? Um, and we've seen, of course, the inability of Congress uh, as an entity to come forward with any coherent policy, no comprehensive immigration reform we've seen in the last 20 years. And it's often been left to presidents like President Obama um, via an executive order um, and, and acting, if that's the right word, DACA, the Deferred Action Against Childhood Arrivals. And we've seen President Trump, through a number of executive actions, similarly attempt to deal with the problem of immigration broadly, but undocumented immigrants more specifically. All of this, of course, against 240 years of history where the United States has grown, its population has changed, has accepted waves of immigrants from all around the world. And up until this time in our history, thankfully, we've been able to be made and then remade by the nature of those who come and become Americans, those who assimilate, those who embrace the culture, embrace the language, embrace the history of um, the country that they've chosen to make their new home. And we've seen that through various institutions within our country, through churches, through schools, through civic organizations, we've facilitated the assimilation of people wanting to become Americans, respecting the culture of their ancestors, the language of their ancestors, the faith of their ancestors, but nonetheless somehow subordinating all of that to being Americans. And the beauty of assimilation is that look all around the world and where you see failed or failing states, countries that are poorly governed, um, uh, poorly organized, you often find an inability of governments causing people living within those countries to embrace the nationality of their native state. We look across the Middle East, we've talked about this in the past, but I suspect one of the great reasons why countries like Iraq, Jordan, Syria are barely functioning states is because not enough people living in Iraq, Jordan, and Syria have embraced the nature of being a Syrian or a Jordanian or an Iraqi as their primary way of identifying themselves. And instead, of course, Arab, Kurd, Turkmen, um, um, Persian, Sunni, Shiite, this tribe, that tribe, another tribe. The lack of building feelings of nationalism, the lack of facilitating the embrace of a common nationality has been the downfall of many a country throughout the world. But in the United States, we as a country early on mastered this assimilation. So it's important to recognize that the United States as a country has grown to its geographic area and has grown to be the third most populous country in the world, 330 million people living here, incrementally, maybe even 
somewhat orderly over a period in, in toto of more than 400 years. Um, in some collaboration with, with a colleague of mine at the, at the University of Tampa, we attempted to break down the history of immigration into the United States to try to identify the certain different periods where certain parts of the United States were settled by immigrant groups that eventually would come from various different parts of the world. Now, all of us who have studied American history knows, of course, that in 1492, Columbus, if I might say that name in, in this gathering, sailed the ocean blue, an Italian-born sailor sailing in the service of a Spanish queen. One of the many European countries, the British, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, along with the Spanish, that by the late 15th century had mastered the ability to build large sturdy vessels and more reliably sail them across the vast Atlantic Ocean to discover new lands, the Western Hemisphere, North and South America. So through the 1500s, we would see the rate and the pace of these voyages um, increase. And being the era of colonialism, we would see that any time a patch of seemingly vacant land was found, a flag would be planted on behalf of the Western European monarch who had funded that endeavor. So by the early, um, by the mid 1600s, we would see Great Britain come to control what would eventually become the original 13 American colonies. All of that land along the eastern seaboard of the United States. By the early 1700s, 13 independent separate British colonies had been established. And it's fair to say that those largely British immigrants coming from somewhere in the UK, from England, Wales, Ireland, to live in one of these 13 colonies, constituted one of the first immigrant groups to come and enjoy um, the blessings of America. We would see, however, almost immediately following the establishment of two of the early colonies, Massachusetts and Virginia, by 1619, there would soon um, evolve a more noxious, pernicious type of immigration. And that, of course, would be compelled immigration of African slaves in what was really a worldwide slave trade, many of whom would make their way to one of the British colonies in America and become this separate, distinct, involuntary immigrant group making their way to the Americas. And it's notable, of course, that there are so many African Americans today who are able to trace their ancestry back many, many generations to some of these first early arrived African slaves. Now, what brought the British settlers over to the American colonies? The answer, as often has been the case in American history, was opportunity. Economic opportunity, opportunity to acquire some land, opportunity to get away um, from a debtor's prison or an angry spouse and a bunch of kids, who knows? But opportunity that the British colonies in America seemed to hold. And we would watch and recognize some very stable um, migration patterns where those who lived in coastal parts of Britain who survived on fishing or shipbuilding gravitated to colonies in America where fishing and shipbuilding were um, more uh, profitable trades. We would see lots of Brits who were farmers in the old country make their way to some of the mid-Atlantic and southern colonies where farming and the export of cotton and tobacco 
um, were the economic engine um, driving those colonies. We would see, again, timber um, farmers, and we would see craftsmen, furniture makers, gravitating to those cities like Providence and Philadelphia where some of the earliest furniture making, skilled manufacturing, if you will, um, was occurring in the American states. So the birth of the United States of America, the writing of a Declaration of Independence, the assertion that all men are created equal and endowed with inalienable rights was the work of a group of colonial residents who were very similar, a very homogeneous group, unlike the America that would begin to evolve in the 200 years that would follow. Back at the time of the revolution, the writing of the declaration, almost every free colonial resident was either British by birth or British by ancestry. He spoke English, practiced a Western European Protestant religion if he was devout, and most of them were. They celebrated British holidays, they recognized British traditions, they were again a very homogeneous group, and this would represent the nucleus of those individuals who again would write the Declaration, successfully wage a revolutionary war, and then come back, of course, to end the process by writing both the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. At the time these documents were written and ratified, uh, the Bill of Rights, the last of the three, ratified in 1791, America's population, as reflected in the very first census of 1790, wherein um, native indigenous Americans, the Indian population, did not count, where until the census of 1860, according to how the Constitution was originally written, each slave counted as just three-fifths of a person. The counted American population in 1790 was overwhelmingly British by either birth still um, or by ancestry. But nonetheless, the United States began to grow. The Constitution had a method for admitting new states into the Union, and by um, the early 1800, states like Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, um, Vermont, a little later Ohio, Louisiana would be admitted to the Union. And then by the 1810s, the great acquisition that Thomas Jefferson had made by virtue of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 would provide the United States with land that was equal in size to the United States as a country as it existed in that year of the Louisiana Purchase, 1803. Um, by 1850, in the treaties and negotiations that ended the Mexican-American War, the United States would fill out the landmass of what are today the continental 48 United States by acquiring most of what is today or what are today the southwestern United States from the government of Mexico. So through the 19th century, certainly the early 19th century, a big question looming in Congress was how were we going to bring these vast lands under our control between the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean? How were they going to be settled? How were they going to be populated? How were they going to be organized in ways that would eventually permit them to be admitted to the Union as new states? So it's not coincidental that one of the great construction feats of the early 19th century would facilitate the opening up to the previously known Northwest Territory, what we recognize today as those states that lie along one of the five Great Lakes.
1825, the Erie Canal was completed and open for business. Anyone who's seen it or has been uh, fortunate enough to travel down it know that it's just a small waterway with various locks along the journey. But in 1825, quite critically, the Erie Canal connected the Hudson River to Lake Erie, thus opening up shipping to all five of the Great Lakes, which collectively, by the way, possess about 20% of all the fresh water found on Earth within those five Great Lakes. So all of a sudden, it was possible via vessel, via um, shipping, to travel up the Hudson, across the Erie Canal, through the Great Lakes, to small cities, small villages, becoming towns, and then cities that were um, forming up, and conversely, transport goods and produce from cities on the Great Lakes, through the canal, down the Hudson River, to New York, Philadelphia, and to destinations beyond. So by the 1820s and the 1830s, the United States was actively looking to find settlers, emigrants, who would come and make these more northerly, upper Midwestern areas habitable. The United States would send agents to what are today the Scandinavian countries of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, to the more than 100 um, duchies, principalities, little um, fiefdoms that in 1870 would be unified as Germany. These recruiters going trying to induce people to leave Northern Europe to settle in America, a place that had, or at least the agents asserted, lots of geographical similarities to the places that these settlers would be leaving behind. So beginning around 1820 and lasting until the beginning of the Civil War really, we would see the second great wave of immigration in American history begin, one that would eventually bring uh, more than 15 million individual immigrants to the United States. And again, these journeys were slow, they were sometimes hazardous, um, they were probably nauseating if you were one in one of the less comfortable parts of the ships, and we would see the first significant migration of northern Europeans making their way to America. We would see, of course, some of them staying on the East Coast port of entry in which they'd come, or, or near to it, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New York, or Boston, but we would see lots and lots and lots of them migrate inward. We would see them bring some of the great traditions of, um, of wheat farming, a little later, corn farming. We would see uh, the Germans bring all of the great ways of making beer and the Scandinavians in Wisconsin, dairy farmers, producing all these delicious and, and exotic cheeses for consumption. And we would see them begin the process of assimilating, of leaving behind some of the associations with Northern Europe and instead embracing uh, what it means to be American. The Germans bring in all kinds of different great sausages, if you think about it, to, to the Americas for the first time. And they would leave part of their culture, of course, in the United States. And we would see today, if you were to travel to Minnesota or Wisconsin or parts of Illinois, villages and towns that were very much um, reminiscent of the places that had been left behind in um, Northern Europe. So again, they were different. They were Scandinavian, Germanic, Central European, but they were Christian. Maybe they were Lutherans, maybe they were practicing some other denomination, but religiously 
they were still broadly within that wide swath of Protestant denominations that perhaps made their entry into the United States a, a little easier. Um, in 1848, throughout Europe, a number of liberal revolutions, uprisings against various kings and princes in the Germanic areas, in Italy, in Austria-Hungary, were initiated hoping to bring about the creation of some American-style democracy. And for the most part, all of those revolutions failed. By the 1840s, we were watching the beginning of industry and the ease of manufacturing, and in some cases, farming, where lots of people with a little vision could see that whatever livelihood they'd had um, doing something that was more labor intensive was soon going to be replaced by a machine of some type. The 1840s would be notable for number one, bringing the first significant Jewish immigration into the United States. We know, of course, that back in the colonial days, there were significant numbers of um, Sephardic Jewish settlers who had come from Western Europe to settle in the American colonies. Some of the oldest American Jewish families are the ancestors of these individuals. But by the 1840s and 1850s, we were watching a significant migration of German Jews who, generally speaking, um, tended to assimilate quite well, came from parts of Europe that were thought to be more advanced, better educated their children, came from a country, the Germanic areas, that was viewed as being more tolerant towards Jews, certainly when compared to those nasty Russians and their czars uh, to the east. And as a result, we would see the predecessors of the Lehman family, um, the Schiffs, the Kuhns, the Loebs, Robert Moses, who we've spoken about many times, is a direct descendant of these German Jewish immigrants who were, for the most part, assimilated, created a society and a lifestyle of their own, and I guess religiously tended to be more um, reformist in, in how they practiced their faith. Ironically, it was not a very notable, not a very demonized at the time um, period of Jewish immigration into America. But by 1850, following the failure of potato crops in, in Ireland, we would see this mass arrival of Irish immigrants coming through New York or Baltimore or Boston most of them, I suspect, staying somewhere along on the Atlantic seaboard, and they would constitute the first mass Catholic immigration into the United States. Again, a country that was wholeheartedly, stridently Protestant, and a country that, for whatever it's worth, was still in the so-called period, the second great religious awakening, a period of heightened um, religious practice, heightened um, evangelical practice. So what do you make of these Catholics coming in ship after ship after ship? The word was that Catholics could not be compelled, could not be um, could not be persuaded to assimilate because it was believed that Catholics could not subordinate the, their loyalty to their church and their loyalty to their pope, to their loyalty for any country, any state, any government, or any president. So almost right on cue, you know, you're watching your watch and saying, okay, here's a good time. In 1852, in advance of national elections that year, a brand new political party, technically called 
the Native American Party was formed that had in its platform a very healthy anti-immigrant set of planks, and it was reputed a very particularly um, harsh view towards Catholics. So unusual um, for a political party to espouse these beliefs at the time, members of the Native American Party were instructed that when asked whether or not their party was in fact anti-Catholic, they should answer, I know nothing about that. And evidently, lots of them answered that way because America remembers this party as the Know Nothing Party. Again, one of the first organized ways to impede a certain type of immigration coming into the United States. Um, by this time, gold, of course, had been discovered in California. The California Gold Rush began in 1849 and continued into the 1850s. And we would see a significant amount of immigration really from all over the world, fortune seekers making their way to California, but lots of immigrants from Asia and particularly from China making their way to the west coast of the United States as California's population boomed during this period of time. Now, the 1850s, of course, would be a, a horrible decade in American history. Uh, the inability of Congress with a series of weak presidents to deal with questions regarding slavery, um, not necessarily whether or not slavery was proper or not, whether it was moral or not, but instead whether or not slavery as an institution should be permitted to exist in new states that were entering the Union, set the foundation for Abraham Lincoln's election as the first Republican president in 1860, and very soon thereafter, beginning in December of 1860, the seceding of eventually 13 southern states, slave states, all of them, from the Union, and on April 12, 1861, the beginning of the American Civil War, um, a country that had in the census of 1860, its population counted at 31 million, would experience four years of warfare, almost exactly four years, um, in which probably as many as 800,000 Americans lost their lives, somewhere between two and three percent of America's total population when the war began. Farms were overrun and set afire. Railroads were wrecked. Civilian loss of life significant, as well as those, of course, troops in the battlefield. And in those earlier times, what might not have been um, a soldier immediately killed by some horrible blow he suffered often meant a slower lingering death because of some infection or illness or disease that might have run through camps in this horrible period of, of American history. Mercifully, the Civil War ended in April of 1865, and by that time, by virtue of order of uh, President Abraham Lincoln, the Transcontinental Railroad was already underway. Um, and we would see, of course, a significant number of Chinese workers participate in the construction of the leg traveling from Oakland in, on San Francisco Bay um, to westward, eastward rather, um, towards Promontory Point in, in Utah, where the Great Golden Spike was um, um, driven into the ground. By the end of the war, it was evident that the United States was a country on the cusp, or maybe already in the midst, of significant change change driven by industry. The great American Industrial Revolution had already begun. So through the refining of oil, this suddenly ubiquitous substance that could be drilled out of the ground, a multitude 
of useful products could be made. Initially, um, kerosene, Vaseline, um, lubricating oils, later, of course, uh, gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel, oil, a great product of America's Industrial Revolution. Through various advances in the manufacturing of steel, America's almost endless supplies of iron ore could more quickly, more efficiently be transformed into stronger steel so that the United States following the end of the Civil War would be a country in which steel would form the backbone of not just railways, but buildings that through the use of steel could be built taller than the normal two-story limit that wood construction um, imposed upon builders. We would see following the end of the Civil War, the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s, a burst of ingenuity as thousands and thousands of patent applications were filed to again find better and more efficient uses for oil, manufacturing of steel, coal, again, another seemingly limitless resource in the United States, often used to drive steam engines that made industrial manufacturing possible. Thomas Edison, fiddling around with filaments and electricity, the light bulb, paved the way for the great electrification of the United States. We would see a more industrial America lead to the urbanizing of much of America, or certainly a more um, systematic urbanizing of the United States. Boston and Philly and New York had been big cities for a long time, but all of a sudden, in the upper Midwest, usually along a navigable waterway or near a railroad terminus, we would see massive oil refineries, enormous steel mills, great rail yards, factories of just about every kind that suddenly required the labors of hundreds, if not thousands, of workers to make these early industrial um, operations uh, more efficient. We lost a lot of young people in the Civil War just a few years before. Lots were injured and disabled. Sure, in this great building of industry where people had to live in close proximity to where they worked, we would see the beginning of the building of America's great cities. Um, places like Scranton, we've heard a lot about Scranton lately, Wilmington, Youngstown, Akron, Hammond, Indiana, Gary, Indiana, Chicago, grew almost overnight from little settlements, little villages to great cities because industry was the anchor Industry was the magnet that attracted those who had to live close to where they were. So we would watch as the great migration of American workers um, began, young men and women, I suspect, I don't know who I sound like there, um, leaving the farms, leaving the ranches to find a more productive life, a more exciting life in these cities. But it turns out that Americans alone could not meet the need for labor. Where have we heard that ever in our history? So once again, we would see Europe answer the call. But this time, we would see other parts of Europe, specifically Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, be the place to which agents of American manufacturing companies made their way. Agents of an enormous, fast, new generation of steamship company that could cross the oceans much more quickly, much less expensively. 
trying to attract people to make their way from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, which at the time were not only the poorest parts of Europe, but in many cases they were the most poorly governed parts of Europe as well. If you happen to be a Jew living in Eastern Europe, close to the realm of the Russian Tsar, it was a danger to live there because of the sometimes organized pogroms and other attacks that were instigated by the populations there against Jews living in those areas. So sometime in the late 1870s, what we refer to as the great wave of immigration to America began. Between 1880 and 1920, 25 million immigrants would make their way to the United States, some a few from our own hemisphere, but overwhelmingly from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. They would make three million Jews within that number, making their way to live in the United States. Somebody had to do the work in garment factories. Someone had to work mining coal and work in steel mills and work as stonemasons in the building of these great American homes and these great um, buildings that were coming up in, in uh, large cities throughout the United States. And this immigrant population turned out to be the backbone of a lot of that hard work that was done. Millions of Italians, my people, Sicilians, we don't call ourselves Italians, and even more so, Italians don't call Sicilians <laughs> Italians, making their way over to the United States. Greeks, Hungarians, Poles, a number of Slavic people, Russians, Ukrainians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Slovakians, um, Hungarians, Romanians, all again coming to the United States because the United States offered opportunity, the United States offered work, and if you were among a persecuted population like Eastern European Jews, you might have heard that the United States was a country that did not discriminate against people because of the religion that they practice. In fact, it was guaranteed in the American Constitution. So the wave came, and, and to show the effect that immigration had on America's population, in 1860, the year before the Civil War began, began America's population, 31 million. Um, by 1900, the population of the United States had more than tripled to 95 million. By 1920, when things started to go kind of badly um, um, for recent crops of immigrants, America's population had swelled to almost 115 million. Um, certainly in large parts of cities on the East Coast, in New York, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, New York in particular, the city's population exploded because of the number of immigrants coming to live and initially work in industries um, throughout the New York area. For a very long time, the garment industry, um, employing uh, more Americans than any other industry um, in the United States. These workers, again, would become part of a great labor pool. Um, they would often be, as is still the case, I think, for people going to make their lives in another country, people living in some of the more depressed areas, some of the more dangerous areas. In, in many cities by the 1880s and the 1890s, city fathers were overwhelmed by the sheer number of people coming to live within their borders and, and the disposal of garbage, you know, safe drinking water, um, fire protection, police protection um, were, were very much challenging uh, to, to meet. But the immigrant population at the time, again, were people 
that came to America and embraced what it meant to live in a new country. They became Americanized. Although it would take a few decades to um, bring this about. Because again, almost on cue, by the late 1880s, there were a number of leading figures in Congress, in medicine, in science, esteemed zoologists and curators of institutions like the Museum of Natural History in New York City, who were looking at the streams of immigrants coming into the United States and concluding that this type of immigrant was not good for America. This type of immigrant had defects, some genetic, some moral, some religious, that would only work for and to the detriment of the United States. None other than the esteemed United States Senator, Henry Cabot Lodge. You know what they say about the Cabots and the Lodges in, in Boston. You know, they breathe that very rarefied air. Was among those who in 1893 brought about the creation of a nice quaint organization known as the Immigration Restriction League that set about to cause Congress to enact laws to restrict, and in some cases, prohibit further immigration into the United States, particularly from those coming from Eastern Europe and in Southern Europe. Last year, um, an author by the name of Daniel Okrent, O-K-R-E-N-T, who in my mind wrote the best book about the history of prohibition several years ago, published a book entitled The Guarded Gate, talking exactly about the organized way in which leading lights in American society used, and this is the subtitle of the book, Bigotry, Eugenics, and the Law, that kept two generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America. The idea again, we're full, we don't want your type, Congress do something to make it happen. It took a long time for the political will to eventually um, emerge. Now, we remember of course that in 1883, the Statue of Liberty had been erected in, in New York Harbor. Um, what had been known as Bedloe Island became Liberty Island as this great, massive, beautiful gift from the nation of France to the United States to honor its centennial in 1876 was erected. By 1903, 20 years later, so many immigrants had seen the Statue of Liberty as the first notable image after making a long journey from Europe to the United States, an inscription was placed on the base of the Statue of Liberty incorporating a poem that had been written by Emma Lazarus that includes, of course, some of the immortal language, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And that is the feeling and, and the sentiment that so many generations of immigrants coming into the United States at this time felt when, when they saw um, Lady Liberty. Now, in order to facilitate, expedite, create a basis for Congress imposing specific restrictive immigration laws into the country, a historical record, a record of facts had to be built back when Congress actually collected facts and, and, and acted upon them. So that in 1907, Congress formed a bipartisan investigating committee, House and Senate, 
led by Vermont Senator William Dillingham, which was charged, it took him four years, of course, to travel all around the country, talk to city leaders, see cities and factories and settlement areas for yourself, and report back to Congress on the effect that the current state of immigration was having in the United States. Like Congress at the time, the report of the Dillingham Commission covered 41 volumes of facts and research and commentary. But here is some of the more um, interesting parts of it, if you will permit me to find it. The Dillingham report concluded immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe posed a serious threat to American society and culture and should be greatly reduced in the future. One of the ways that Congress opined that these um, restrictions could be effectuated was by the utilization of literacy tests as the most feasible single uh, method of restricting undesirable immigration. During this time, um, pseudosciences emerged. Um, phrenologists, ethnologists, social Darwinists, eugenicists, zoologists, who came up with all types of biological scientific evidence as to why Italians or Poles or Jews were less inferior to Western Europeans and particularly Americans, and how intermarriage between these less desirable peoples and Americans would invariably lead to the degradation of America's stock. So through the teens, 1900 to 1920, we would see a number of movements um, uh, catch fire. Prohibition would become, of course, the law of the land, 1919. Women's suffrage, congratulations to all the women out here. You probably know that 100 years ago, um, August, um, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, giving um, women the right to vote and implicitly hold office throughout the United States. And it turns out that the United States entering the First World War, three years almost, we sort of were bystanders, watching Europeans whack the heck out of each other in the modern world's first significant industrialized war. Um, we know, of course, that in February of 1917, a revolution in Russia, one of the main participants in the war, led to the abdication of Nicholas II, the last czar of Russia, and eventually the rise to power of a communist group calling themselves the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin, with notable advisors um, such as men like Zukharov, Bulgarin, Trotsky, Stalin, and others. So when the fighting had ended in early 1919, um, rather in, well, when the fighting ended on November the 11th, 1918, and the treaties that ended the war were negotiated the following year, in the United States, there was already a significant fear of what a communist presence might represent in the United States. For at least two decades, probably a little longer, there existed in the United States um, the first attempts to organize laborers in order to bargain for better wages, safer and better working conditions. Um, after the Triangle Shirtwaist um, factory fire in 1911. Um, states began to pass laws um, bringing about, again, safer working conditions for all. Um, because the 
um, Communist Manifesto, the book upon which um, socialist ideologies, including Bolshevism, was based, had been written by Karl Marx, a Jew, and because so many prominent Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and other leading communists in Russia were Jews, and because it turns out that a lot of the most passionate labor leaders in this very early period of the labor movement were either Jewish, many Italian, because most of the menial workers in many cities were Jewish or Italian, um, there began to be an equivalency drawn between what had happened in Russia and all of these rabble-rousing labor activists in the United States. We really have to do something unless we want to face something similar to what occurred um, to Nicholas II in 1917. So we hear, of course, of important elections, the most important election in our lifetime, the most important election in a generation. It turns out that, that in 1920, when Americans went to vote in the first national elections following the end of the First World War, um, Warren G. Harding, the Republican nominee, routed his Democratic um, rival, James Cox, who was then the governor of Ohio, and Republicans swept to gain control of both houses of Congress. Um, Republicans would control the White House and both houses of Congress um, from the elections of 1920 all the way up until FDR's election in 1932. The American heartland had cried for prohibition and the cessation and the control of the demon alcohol, much of the American heartland not really knowing lots of immigrants firsthand perhaps, but heard a lot of bad things about them. They drank in taverns, they drank uh, sacramental wines for, for their religious ceremonies, all of the eugenicists had spoken about them, and the social Darwinists cried out for immigration reform. And immigration reform they got. Um, in 19... 24, Congress passed a series of laws cumulatively um, known as the Immigration Act of 1924. For one, it dealt with what certainly in the West was considered the most dangerous type of immigration, Asian immigration into the United States never widely advertised, never widely encouraged as immigration had been from Europe to the east coast of the United States. Congress dealt with that in 1924 by virtue of the Asian Restriction Act, which the Asian Exclusion Act, which quite simply banned all legal Asian immigration into the United States. Very easy. Our West Coast and those borders are closed to Asian immigrants. Congress, however, wanted to still experience European immigration into America but from only parts of Europe that Congress thought produced people who on par were of the same intelligence and height and, and honesty of Americans themselves. So through the National Origins Act of 1924, Congress for the very first time established a quota system. That meant for all practical purposes in layman's terms, that every year from every country into which immigration into the United States was legal, immigrants from every country would be limited 
every year to 2% of the number of people from the country in question who had lived in the United States in 1890. Not 1900, not 1910, not 1920, because again, Eastern and Southern European numbers in those 30 years had risen dramatically. But 1890, a time when arguably the great wave was just beginning. So with these lower starting points, the number of Poles in the United States in 1890, Lithuanians, um, Romanians, Italians, 2% of that number turned out to create very low quota numbers. Whereas I suspect in 1890, there were millions and millions of British descended, French, um, Dutch, Scandinavian. So 2% of those numbers tended to create very large quota numbers for them. And the results, of course, were very much foreseeable. Asian immigration came to an end. The amount of legal Italian, Sicilian, Eastern European immigration, Greek to the United States, diminished significantly by virtue of, of these quotas. Um, and immigration from um, um, our own hemisphere, from the Caribbean, from South America, from Caribbean islands increased. Um, Colin Powell's um, parents immigrated to the United States um, during this period of time. And for whatever it's worth, at the end of World War I, I think particularly because the quotas had so depleted the less skilled Eastern European um, and Southern European immigrant. You know, people who came to the United States um, not only not able to read or write or speak English, many were not literate in their own native tongue. Um, the other night we came across a group of my relatives who had come from the United States to the United States from Sicily in 1963, 57 years ago, and they spoke with such heavy accents, it was hard to make out what they were saying. So these things sometimes took time. So with this cessation of immigration again from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, we would see the great migration of African Americans from the South really accelerate as they began to leave states with very restrictive and punitive and mean-spirited Jim Crow laws to make their way into the American industrial heartland, into more at the time racially tolerant parts of the United States in order maybe to fill the need for labor that had been created, but also undeniably to make better lives of, of themselves. We know, of course, the plight of the um, SS St. Louis, um, this ship full of Jews who believed they'd escaped from France after Germany invaded France in, in 1940, only to be turned away from the United States because arguably that quota for that ethnicity of passenger had been filled. And we know many of them, of course, would meet their ends in horrible ways um, as it was forced to return to um, Europe. Now, the Second World War comes to an end, but all the way until 1965, for again, 40 years, the National Origins Act, the Immigration Act of 1924, was still the law of the land in the United States. Other countries digging themselves out of the ravages of war had established laws recognizing the refugee, like all of those people on the St. Louis, and create policies to more openly and easily permit people trying to get out of harm's way from finding safe haven 
in countries that would protect them, but it would not be until 1965. It would not be until the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, you know, picking up in some cases where uh, JFK had begun. Not only did um, Johnson, of course, sign the bill uh, making Medicare the law of the land and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and later the Fair Housing Act, um, Johnson signed into law a bill co-sponsored by Senator Philip Hart and Congressman Emanuel Seller, who I believe represented a district in Brooklyn. It was known as the Hart-Seller Act. When Johnson signed it into law, it became the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, part of Johnson's Great Society. It was intended to re-stimulate European immigration to America, particularly, again, from eastern parts of Europe and southern parts of Europe. By 1965, those areas had pretty much rebuilt themselves from the ravages of war, had adopted those, again, more generous uh, democratic socialist forms of government. People were pretty happy in much of Europe in the 1960s. So that expected wave of immigration did not come. And instead, we would see the focus turn elsewhere. Asians, excluded for so long from China, from the Philippines, from Pakistan, from India, began to make their way into the United States. At the same time, we would see from the Middle East, from Saharan Africa, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from South America. Again, copious amounts of immigrants making their way to the United States. And again, the challenges of assimilation were still there, but the United States again worked its magic, often permitting us to keep the best of the brightest from many of these countries coming to study in the United States going to the beach, listening to the music, um, recognizing the wealth of our country, and choosing to stay and become Americans. Now, President Johnson's um, act, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, codified some very important aspects of things that today are causing a great amount of debate regarding the nature of immigration and immigration policy in America. For one, it created the concept of becoming a permanent resident alien. Once that's acquired, the individual in question would be permitted to live in the United States legally for the rest of their lives, most of course eventually seeking to obtain citizenship. Once a permanent resident alien status was established, the 1965 law encouraged a concept known as family reunification. Many of us probably have immigrant ancestors that came in waves. The father came first, his able-bodied sons, they worked, they saved, in the goal of eventually bringing the rest of the family to America to live with them. This 1965 law made legal and guaranteed that once a citizen or a permanent resident alien was in the United States, he could begin the process of reunifying his family, spouse, children, parents, siblings, you know, sometimes nephews and nieces. Again, this, this reconstructing a family here who had come from somewhere else over there. And, and this became a very important part of, um, of uh, American immigration law. Family reunification, we know, is now sometimes derisively called chain migration. Somebody comes and gets a little status, then all of a sudden, 85 relatives are coming to live here. At least that's how some people describe it. Now, way back, in 1867, following the end of the Civil War, 
the 14th Amendment very famously began by stating anyone born in the United States is a citizen of the United States and of the state in which they reside. Intended at the time to confer blanket citizenship on now emancipated slaves who because of 1857's Dred Scott decision, which said African slaves and their descendants were not American citizens, the 14th Amendment was intended to confer that citizenship status on them. 150 years later, courts consistently hold that the birthright citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment means exactly what it says, so that anyone born on American soil is born an American citizen, period. End of story. So Kamala Harris was born in Oakland to parents who at the time of her birth were not American citizens. They were students studying in the United States. Marco Rubio was born in Florida to parents who at the time of his birth had green cards, permanent resident aliens. But because Marco Rubio was born in the United States, like Kamala Harris, they became American citizens at the time of their birth. We now sometimes hear that families who come to the United States, who have a child, babies, that are American citizens, even though their parents may not be, are anchor babies, not babies beneficiaries of the 14th Amendment, but more perniciously, you know, babies intended to somehow give their parents greater status to stay in our, in our country. Um, the 1965 law embraced the notion of the refugee and stated that anyone who could demonstrate that if they were compelled to stay in the country where they were born, where they were living, and faced imminent harm because of religion, race, ethnicity, or political thought or belief, the United States would provide that haven to them by um, um, conferring refugee status upon them. And it could be, in theory, limitless, as this was a, a benevolent humanitarian gesture to save those under oppression, again, for certain types of, of characteristics. Now, for the last 40 years, since the 1980s, we've been made aware of the growing number of people who come into the country without any documentation. They don't get in line, they don't get visas, they come across a border. More often than not, they fly into an airport on a visa and then overstay a visa and just stay here. They have children and their children suddenly become American citizens, but the parents are not here in a legal and, and documented way. What do you do with them? That in many respects until uh, President Trump began to attack immigration uh, policy more broadly, um, not just hoping to deal with illegal immigrants, but also slow down the admission of refugees and to reduce the numbers who can immigrate to our country legally through normal immigration channels. What to do with the illegals, the undocuments, has been, of course, the great question. The last significant piece of legislation would come in 1987 when President Reagan, the Gipper, Ronald Reagan, signed a bipartisan comprehensive immigration bill, you know, not in the um, basement of the White House at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, but on Liberty Island making a speech about how giving legal status and a pathway to citizenship to the six million or so then thought to be um, 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 
ineligible, illegal immigrants in the United States was the right thing to do, the right thing for America to do. Um, numbers, of course, have grown. The estimates have changed. And in this century, in the last 20 years, we've seen Congress completely unable to find any partial um, solution to, again, this difficult problem. What do you do with those who are here in an undocumented way? You know, how do you answer calls that they're not assimilating? They don't want to be Americans. They don't want to learn English. They shop in stores where they don't have to speak English. Many of the old arguments sort of um, from the past has been a political challenge that we thought maybe was, was going to head towards some sort of a resolution um, by, well, by 2015, half of Americans or half of the people living in the United States under the age of 18 um, were children of immigrants. They were non-white, a phenomenon that is only going to grow. Um, states like Arizona, New Mexico, California, Texas, Georgia soon are reaching a stage where they are so-called minority majority states, where white is the most numerous race in that state's population, but it's less than 50% of the state's total population. So among the issues that are, are on the ballot this November, although the arguments aren't nearly as loud or as um, um, repetitive as they were four years ago, is what direction are we as a country going to pursue regarding immigration, legal immigration, the cleaning up of those who are DACA recipients, those people who came very young, brought here by their parents, who aren't citizens. How do you deal with the undocumented who are here? Most of them, I suspect, overwhelmingly devout people who, who want to work. And what is going to be our position regarding refugees? Um, the admission of refugees in the United States has trickled down to just a few drops as a matter of policy. And again, these are all things we voted for. These are things that are among the choices that the president and, and policymakers can choose to make. And we currently have a system where it's very difficult to win and claim refugee status to come and live in the United States. So something to think about, something to chew on, because I suspect uh, unless and except for those who are um, the descendants of indigenous people, of, of Native Americans, I suspect each and every one of us um, is the descendant of some brave immigrant, for the most part, who took a long journey to a place they knew little about. Maybe some came because they heard the fake news that the streets were paved with gold. But at the time, the United States was paved with, with opportunity. And, and I think that somehow each of us have to, to balance our own knowledge of our own family's history. Everyone's got a story on, on how they came to be where they are, has to think about that as, as we think about the United States moving forward. So thank you as always for joining us. Um, next month, I look forward to um, speaking to you all when we look at the two candidates and look at where they stand on the issues, on gun policy, on health care on immigration, on COVID, a whole variety of issues. And then our second um, lecture in October is going to be yet another look. I've done this lecture probably five times. The history of women in American politics, the evolving history of women in American politics, the still evolving history of women in American politics, in recognition of the 100th anniversary of the um, ratification of the 19th Amendment, we are going to look at the women's suffrage movement in American history, right up there with all of the great movements that Americans have created to bring about significant societal 
and political change. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you all again soon. Take care.